الله الله لا إله إلا الله الله Islamism is, means submission and obedience to Allah. It's simply <laughs> having a communication between Muslims and it doesn't have an impact or it doesn't create understanding to those who are not Muslims. So this is how at least I looked at it. And so in the first way in which we try to understand what Islam means and what it, how it relates to us, we examine three basic verses. And, and like I said last week, there were many. But these are the three basic verses that we um, were discussing. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, بَعْدَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبًا So if they ask you about me, so who am I, where am I? Then Allah says, Ya Muhammad, then tell them about me that I am indeed verily I am near to them. And then in other verses, we talk about Allah saying, He is nearer to us than a juggler vein. And last week, we examined what does it mean, right? Why, why juggler vein? Why this metaphor and a physical sign that Allah talks about when he refers to a juggler vein. And then he says, I respond to invocation or the supplication of uh, my servants, but with a the will, they need to respond to my call, believe in me, so that they may walk the right path. In other principles that we can get from this uh, verse of the Quran is that whenever Allah commands us to do something, and in this case, to listen to him with a will, right, he always will, uh, in the same verse, will tell us exactly the benefit of that obedience. And here he says, so that they may walk the right path. La'allahum yarshudun. So the benefit of doing this, of submitting, of obeying, is really to us and not to anyone else. It's not even the benefit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's completely independent. He doesn't need anyone to, do, to, to, to rely on. So the benefit that Allah has enjoined this for us is really for us. And then we talk about Surah Az-Zumar, in which Allah says, Qul ya ibadiyya asrafu ala anfusihim. O oh, my servants who have transgressed upon their own souls. And then what he says, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Acknowledging the, uh, the frailty um, of our human condition, that we're not perfect. And sometimes when we take 10 steps forward, we take 5 steps back. But nonetheless, carry on. If you have made a mistake, then do not despair. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah because He forgives everything. So fall down and then get up. And the mark of a true believer is not in the smoothness of his, of his voyage or his, or his journey in life, but in the manner in which he attains strength and faith to get up when he fails, when he falls, and then to start all over again. Right? And so, the last verse we also talk about was Surah Al Imran. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa khtala fi lali wa nhar la ayati li ulil albab. Which means, indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the day and the night, are signs for those who understand. So Allah is asking you, first of all, in the first verse we talk about He is near, He responds to our supplication, but with a will, submit. And then you'll benefit. In the second verse, but it's alright, sometimes you fall. It's in the nature of man that we fall because we're not perfect. But it is in the getting up and trying again. And in this verse he says, if you also look at my creative ability, in fi halqis samawati wal ar, and the creation between the heavens and the earth and everything that's in between, wa akhtilafi layli wa nahar, and in the system in which he managed this creation, you will find without doubt that I exist. And so, what he's saying is that in all of our surroundings, in our, the moment that we wake up, the moment that we are able to say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, that I'm awake, that Allah has risen me from, uh, from the dead. We are in constant connection and because He is the one who creates and He is the one who manages. And so, as a model, as a principle that we derive from these three verses to establish what is it of my relationship with God, because we can take all these points, all these verses in piecemeal basis. And the problem is eventually when we try to put them together, it doesn't make sense. And this is sometimes what we fail to do as Muslims because we take them as piecemeal and then we, you know, sometimes even in Nusana we just take one sunnah and then we take them as piecemeal without the benefit of the asbab or the reason or the context and perhaps some slight nuances in, in the narration of the hadith which talks about the same thing. So then we are forced to look at it in, in a holistic manner. And that the same goes with the Quran. So anyway, so we take these three verses and the principle that we have concluded last week is that this. There is an intimate relationship that God establishes between Himself 
and his creator in his creations there's an intimate relationship that god establishes between himself and his creations and that's why we talk about him always forgiving him always guiding him always uh, tell you that he's near to give us sort of cons comfort and solace that we are never alone right like liverpool you'll never walk alone you are never alone in that sense because god is always with us and so today I want to examine a second big principle within the understanding of Islam. Now, one, we know that Islam is also defined as an adin, as a complete way of life. And this deen is composed of three major components. One, um, it is our belief system, which is Arkanul Iman. And then it is Arkanul Islam, our actions. Right, our deeds to manifest those belief system and finally in terms of perfection which is our ihsan so Allah created creation like I said he, cre he asked us to ponder about his creation and his management so he created creation and then he puts us on earth and he doesn't leave us abandoned right so what he did well he sets out a way of life a system a perspective a worldview a lens in which we see ourselves and what is our role within this big system so in its most basic form, in Hadith Jibril, in which these ideas and this principle is, extra is extracted, then the Prophet ﷺ give us um, uh, what, in terms of his summary of the ministry or the teachings of Islam, which he was trying to espouse. So one, that every Muslim, no matter where they are, have a similar be belief system that you know you attach yourself to and in some basic forms you transfer this belief system in the self of, of action so that you then prove to yourself not to Allah that you indeed believe because Allah knows what is in your heart and then the journey doesn't stop there the journey must be that for all times in regards to this belief system or these actions that you strive and you keep on improving on this these facets and so let us look and we, I'm sure we all know in quite detail what these are. So when we talk about Arkanul Iman or Rukun Iman, articles of faith, there are six. So God talks about first and foremost that you need to believe in Him being the one and only. And this becomes uh, the big umbrella of idea or principle which everything emanates from. That everything that we do must come from this one source and because in reality it comes from this one source that there is only one God and that God is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say this is important because everyone, a lot of religious traditions, also claim to have one God, but they don't refer to the one God as the kind of God that we refer to. The one and only Allah, the God, Al-Ilah. Right? So, everything that we say, that we enjoy, that we have been granted, comes and emanates from that one source. Because there is one creator and the rest are all creation. And even though we think that we work hard in our job and we get that promotion, or we study hard and we get you know, a distinction in our exams, it is really not us because we are the funnel, we are the vessel in which we put in effort and we operate as, you know, as human beings in which we attempt to achieve what Allah has really destined for us. Because the result of the success comes from Him. And this comes from a very important Tawhidid concept that is there is only one God and everything emanates from Him. And it is important because everything that is good and that is bad because of that one source must then come from that one source which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is easy to remember when we get a good thing and we say Alhamdulillah but it's difficult to then attribute some things which are less fortunate happening to us to the big plan and wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so if we do, then we, we manage to put the theory of that one God into practice and that's a big thing. And it's a big deal for Muslims. All right? And so we talk about also belief in the angels of Allah. The messenger between Allah and his, by and large, his prophets to, to perform tasks on behalf of Allah and to send a message to the prophets. And so there is an intimation, a communication between the, these angels and, and the prophets of God. But this doesn't happen to you and me. Okay, so let's be clear. If you think that an angel has come to you, then there's a big problem. So believe in divine revelations of Allah. So <clears throat> there is this guidance, there is this teaching, but this is incorporated as a form of reference in what we call as a divine revelation. And in our time, it is the Quran. 
And there are many other divine revelations that came before us. For example, the Injil, the Torah, the Zabur, the Suhuf, and there are many, many others that were not mentioned. Right? But this remains the four or five which every Muslim must believe. It is not only in the Quran that we believe or we read, but we need to believe and therefore read the other books. But the problem comes in the aspect of authenticity. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has vowed to protect the Quran from corruption, the other books were absent in this, in this matter. And so we find that the authenticity of such books have been distorted through either inclusion of some uh, words or maybe or even some punctuation or exclusion and in any case over time people have included and excluded so many things within those divine books that eventually man forgets what was the original right and so um, and then these books were also were of course given to the prophets and they were the one who in a sense, manifest the meaning of this book by either explaining because of the foresight of the ability of or the experience of having seen things that we are not able to see as a connector between what Allah means and what how we can understand things and also importantly as someone who manifests through his actions the teachings, the message that is being sent to the, from the Quran. And that's why when Sayyidina Aisha was asked about the morality or the ethical of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, her response was simply that it was the Quran. Right? Because sometimes when we read, we think we understand, but we don't understand because of the context in which those verses have been revealed. And so here comes the Prophet who then explains. Right? So for example, even if you buy maybe a computer, and then it comes with uh, you know, a, a manual, and if something wrong, something goes wrong with the computer, do you actually look for the manual? In fact, I bet you that after two or three years that you have this computer, you don't even know where you put the manual. You could have go and find it, but you, do, you won't. Instead, you will go through the internet, and then you ask, for example, for Mac, you have like Mac Genius, and you ask, so there's something wrong with my computer, so what should I do? And then the guy will tell you. But the hal, whereas Allah has already given you the book and the manual in which you refer. So therein comes the importance of prophets who then explain, who then carries out, who then perform in an action form the meanings and the teachings of what has been revealed through in the Quran. And then comes an important aspect of our articles of faith, which is belief in that there is a last day and a day of judgment. It is important for Muslims to believe in this, to hold on to this, because if we do not have a day when we will have to be accounted for all our actions or non-actions, then what is the point? What is the point of saying we believe? And what is the point of trying to restrain ourselves from the prohibitions that Allah has imposed upon us if at the end of the day, the one who was disciplined and the one who completely ignores the guidance from Allah ends up in the same place? Then it doesn't make sense. So why do I need to sacrifice the joy and pleasures of this world when at the end of the day I'm put in the same place as someone who ignored big huge common sense or a, a humane attribute of being kind and compassionate or serving Allah and he, enjoy completely his life on earth and we end up in the same place. So there must be some sense of accountability that distinguish from those who have sacrificed, for those who have complied, for those who have obeyed and those who, who don't. Right? So, this is the importance of the last day. Because if not, we don't even need to talk about belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it doesn't matter. And so the belief in the last day where everyone, despite of all race, gender, uh, inclinations, are put together and gathered and will be accounted to one by one every single thing that he himself forgot what he did. And finally, the thing that wraps it up will be the aspect of divine will. That many things happen to mankind but, right, there are things that happen for a reason and sometimes we understand those reasons and we accept it but there are also many things in life that happens without our ability to, uh, to fathom or, or understand these things because it is beyond our limited understanding, our limited vision, our limited wisdom. So we say that every Muslim must believe in Qada and Qadar. Al Qada'u wal Qadaru Sharuhu wa Sharuhu min Allah Ta'ala. The good and the bad comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So everything that we enjoy or everything that we've been uh, inflicted upon comes from Him. So the question really is, is not why does Allah gives me these hardships? Or 
Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm grateful for this uh, juxtaposite with the goodness that I receive. But the real question for the true believer is, when Allah gives me these contrasting things in life, I am charged with the responsibility as a Khalifa, and I'm tested on how I will react and carry out those responsibilities. So for example, if I'm being given with something extra, Maybe, maybe wealth or whatever, the simplest thing to, to imagine at this point. So maybe I've been given extra wealth and the question is, what have I done in order that I can then face Allah on the Day of Judgment without feeling that I have not performed my role as a Khalifa? Or if you have knowledge, what have I done with that knowledge apart from practicing it myself to share and educate and try to also be a cause for salvation for some others? Right? So. That's one. But what about if you are inflicted with some sense of calamity? And do we respond by asking God, why me? Why despite all my service? Why despite all my belief? Despite all my prayers? Am I inflicted with such things? And sometimes unconsciously we do. So how then is the best way that we respond when we are inflicted with such, with such calamities? It is, as, it is an opportunity that Allah has given to, to those who believe. And this is really a high level because it's not just simply belief by mere utterance. Belief who, is, who has embraced the teachings of, of Islam. That when you're inflicted with such calamities, then Allah is giving you this opportunity to show patience, to show gratitude, and to show the strength of your metal or of your faith in life. So if you manage to survive, if you manage to show that, that patience, to bear patience with these challenges, or to be grateful because it comes from him anyway, so there must be a bigger wisdom beyond what I can envision, then Allah rewards you, then Allah will put you with the greatest of reward in hereafter, which is paradise. And he increased your maqam, your station in the eyes of people in this world and the people in the hereafter. And that's something that no one can give you. I can give you, for example, let's say your name is Ali. And I say, I establish you now, Mr. Ali, as a Dato Ali. Maybe, for example. All right? You can enjoy and revel in that title for a while. But how can you take that permanently when it comes from someone who does not owe anything and whatever he has but virtue of perhaps authority is merely temporary so all he could give you is a temporal thing it's a temporary thing and what you enjoy is merely temporary and so why do you want to hang on to something that is indeed temporary and in fact perhaps has no value if it comes from someone who himself is not God conscious enough Right? But when Allah gives, He gives you an opportunity. And for some of us, we we'll also look at it as a sense of mercy because Allah is still, to a large extent, remembering you. In a sense, taking care of you. Because in the moment of your forgetfulness and He inflicts that pain, or He gives you a sense of loss, and you have no other choice at the end of the day that you, when you're faced at a corner, and you try to ask help from anyone else, even by from yourself, it doesn't happen because the only one that can come to help you at that point is God. And so by giving you that test, He then forces us to go back into that remembrance, to go back into that submission, to go back into that obedience, so that our, our connection, our relationship with Allah becomes more intimate because we've forgotten along the way. And as human beings, we do. Right? And so this becomes the important ambit of what we talk about when we talk about Arkanul Iman or the Articles of Faith. Right? So he gives us this. And then he, does, he doesn't just leave us and say that you must believe, you must believe, or, or, or these few things. But then he makes you perform some form of actions, and this is what we call block, uh, come under Arkanul Islam, or the actions that every Muslim must perform. And we do this because we want to prove to ourselves that we indeed believe in the six Articles of Faith that we just mentioned earlier on. We don't do this because we need to prove to Allah because He knows. We do this because by doing it, our level of conviction becomes more profound and enhanced and it gets raised bit by bit. It doesn't come suddenly. Faith doesn't enter yourself and if you delude yourself, you know, it's sad because it doesn't come suddenly. It comes through a development, a phase. It builds up. 
It's a process, because if life is a journey, then faith is developed through a process. And you gain faith through, for example, experience, maturity, knowledge. It doesn't just come like that, because if it comes like that, it goes like that. So, you, after you believe, you practice. And so the first prayer that you perform is the prayer that you perform because you have to, because your parents enforce it upon you. And it has no absolute, no meaning for you, and you have no understanding of what you're saying. You just do it because you do it. It's something that you have been made to do. But on a daily basis, when you keep on doing this, and then you incorporate this, you complement this, and supplement this by knowledge, by life experiences, by maturity, by looking at how it affects others as well, and then you begin to find a deeper connection, a sense of significance, of meaning, with what you do and what it's supposed to do for you. Which is, in reality, to raise your level of conviction, of faith, slowly but surely. And we take, for example, uh, fasting in the month of Ramadan. Given a choice, not normal, normal human beings don't want to fast. But we fast. And our fast is not, not, only, not only, uh, you know, not drinking, but also not, not eating and other aspects of fasting. And the first time was hard. I mean, even last year, the first few days is hard because you're adjusting to fasting. But as you move forward in the month of Ramadan, it becomes easier as you picked it up. The momentum gets picked up. And it becomes, when it becomes easier, then you begin to believe in it. And you begin to extract some of the benefits that fasting can be derived. In the first few days, you're just struggling from hunger and thirst, and tiredness and sleepiness. Nothing else benefits you. But through training, when you go further in the month of Ramadan, then you begin to see how it then becomes a control uh, factor in your patience, in your anger, in your jealousy, in, in, you know, in, in the thoughts that you, you produce, in the kind of... Uh, negative feelings that you have for others just by looking at them but this fasting then suppresses it and so you begin to an important thing in Ramadan in fasting is that you then begin to learn who you are you know yourself because on a day-to-day -day basis we try to think that we can control our, our anger but we, we can't sometimes in our sarcasm sometimes the way we look sometimes the way we deal with others but Ramadan forces you because there's nothing physically inside you in terms of food, so you go deeper beyond where there was used to be food. So then you get to know yourself, and then you begin to operate, you begin to get intimate with yourself, and finally, hopefully, you get to control yourself. And the whole idea is what you've been trained for in Ramadan, you should then carry on within the next, you know, within the next months. Because then what's the point of being able to control in Ramadan, and then you let your nafs go wild again, right? Okay, so these are, the, these are examples of why actions are important to complement faith. And then it's not enough. There is what we call Ihsan, and Ihsan is defined that you serve Allah as though you see Him. If you do not see Him, then indeed, definitely He sees you. And one important thing that we need to distinguish when you see this is sometimes you look at this, you say, Oh my God, Allah is always watching me. It's extremely uh, terrorizing. <laughs> Right? But the reality of understanding Ihsan in this definition is not that Allah is always watching you. It has a more intimate understanding. The appreciation is that Allah is always with you. So when He is always with you, the things that you do and the things that you say are then filtered in through a more intimate filter. And so what comes out? what you do or what you don't do or what you say or what you don't say is filtered through that more intimate vessel which is the fact that Allah is a part of you He's with you and what you say or do needs to be beautiful because Allah is beauty and whatever comes from Him is beautiful and so there's no need to consciously and tirelessly think about what I need to perform as a sunnah the consciousness of Allah being with you becomes that filter that automatically in everything that you do as much as you can depending on your level of consciousness, filter it for you. And this is why Ihsan is what we call to beautify faith and to beautify actions. And it goes beyond merely ritualistic matters. Because Ihsan can be applied in your job, Ihsan can be applied in the way you answer the phone, Ihsan can be applied in the way that you, you order your food at McDonald's. You know, for example, when you order our food, we just said, Happy meal number one. And this poor, you know, auntie will say, hello, good afternoon, welcome to McDonald's, what would you like to have? 
Happy Meal number one. And then you say, thank you for choosing McDonald's. It would be, for example, $8. Uh, how would you like to pay that? You don't even say anything, just give the cash. And then you say, thank you for uh, you know, patronizing McDonald's and just take the money and go. And to the person who cleans after you, when in fact it is your duty to clean after yourself. I mean, isn't it, isn't, does it make sense? I, I mean, I, I completely understand, you know, uh, you know, when before I start traveling the world, you know, we go to McDonald's and we know that the people is going to clean your food. And then I start to, to travel and it's like, oh my God, I, we've, we've got it all wrong. In fact, we shouldn't even have someone to clean it up because it is our food, it is our junk, we should clean it up ourselves. And that's just basic human decency taking away Islam from this. From this. Right? So this is Ihsan. And the, the ultimate objective of Ihsan is that you become more intimate in your relationship with Allah, with yourself, and with other creations. Right? And so this is a summary of what we know as our adin or our complete way of life. So if last week we talked about how Allah relates to us, through his relationship. Today, we talk about how do we understand the framework of Islam within a traditional notion of understanding it through this concept of Adin, and we talk about Arkadul Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. So the question is, we should not stop there, and this is a problem, we always stop there. So what do we do, and what is Allah trying to do with us when he gives us this, these blessings of Adin? So when we talk about the first lesson uh, last week, about God having an intimate relationship, so for me, when we look at this adin, a profound and yet beautiful thing is being established as a matter of principle for those who believe. And the principle is simply that such intimacy that we spoke about last week does not come out of a vacuum. It is manifested through Allah's guidance for mankind. It is only through this guidance that we can establish, that we can begin to manifest, that we can begin to practice this intimacy or acquire this intimacy. Without this guidance, we don't know how. And, we, and this is clear because when we fall in love, we fall in love and we just fall in love in a way that we didn't fit. And we do whatever we think our emotions carry out, carry out through the day. And a few months down the road, we find that, oh, it's been all wrong. Because this is the guidance that Allah gives, that we do, not, we do not see this in where it stands, we do not picture this in, in where it belongs. And so when we go and conduct our day-to-day -day life, we, we let our hearts, we let our limited mind guide us, and then in the end of it, we find that, oh, it was all a waste because it was wrong. And so for Muslims, Allah does not want to take a risk with us because we only have one life to live. And we bring forward this in the hereafter. So what he's saying is, I'm going to give you these guidelines. And these guidelines, if you practice them, will lead you to a sense of intimacy with me. And if you do so, you will not go wrong and you will only go one place. And that is to go home. And to go home for Muslims is where? Where did our forefather come from? Nabi Adam alayhi salam. Paradise. And that's where home is. And so it's only natural and fitra. And so if you look at the big picture, we say having faith, being a Muslim is fitra. And we take it as a theoretical point, theoretical knowledge. But in reality, in the big picture, this is it. This is why it's called fitra. Because this guidance brings you back home, and home is where you belong, where you come from, and that is fitra. So this concept of fitra is not a romantic notion we pluck from the air, and we just apply it because you cannot explain something. It has a place, it has an explanation, and this today, at least for our kuliah today, what I'm trying to exemplify to you is that such intimacy that we have with Allah that we discussed last week, today, comes from His guidance. And His guidance comes from a framework. And this framework is what we know as Adin, a complete way of life, Rukun Iman, Rukun Islam, and Ihsan. And we try to practice this in its very basic. It is the key, it is the map for us to go home. And home is where we came from, which is paradise, inshallah. So, inshallah, we'll continue with other big principles in Islam, getting from the other information and then trying to make sense of how it falls and how it fits. So, inshallah, I hope you have benefited and I hope through this discussion it gives you a perspective of how to look at yourself and your faith and how then you should work towards going home, inshallah. All right? So, let us then. Uh, close this kuliah by setting Tasbih Kafarah and Surah Al-Asr.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika Ashadu ala ilaha ila anta Nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wal asri innal insana lafi khusur Illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati Wa tawasa bil haq Wa tawasa bil sabur Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh I see you next week insyaAllah